Okay, uh, hi everybody, welcome to the pre-recorded lecture. Let me remind you what we did uh, last time. Last time I finished by introducing Coxter elements. So you start with the crystallographic root system, th root system phi and the corresponding while group W and then the Coxter element element is an element C in W well it's any element given by the product of S1, S2 all the way up to SR so any product of all simple reflections so you choose some simple system and then it depends on the choice of the simple system and on the ordering of these elements. Nevertheless, any two, any two coxeter elements are conjugate in W. In particular, they all have the same order, so which is denoted by H, the coxeter number of w that's the order of one or any of any coxeter element in w the last time we computed type a n uh, in type a n um, in type a n um, here the uh, coxeter elements are coxeter element is any long cycle for example uh, one two just the usual long cycle permitting all elements by shifting them by one module n and the coxeter number consequently is equal to n and then we also discussed like type in type D it's 2n minus 2 so d4 gives you 6 and then e6 e7 e8 are 12 18 and 30 whatever just some integer numbers and okay today I want to continue this kind of train of thought and I want to discuss these Coxter elements a little bit more last time I showed you a picture uh, which looked kind of scary and well kind of nice also and yeah, let me try to explain that picture. And the way to explain that picture is to... Uh, so you look at this Coxter element C. Right? It's, it's a product of reflections. Uh, each, each SI is a reflection in some vector space. And so C is some linear transformation on the vector space. So if your root system lives in some vector space it, it, it spans some vector space B, then C uh, acts on V by a linear transformation. And therefore, we can talk about the eigenvalues of C. Eigenvalues of C. And they all, um, they're always going to have this form well, I mean, C is a finite order automorphism of V. So its eigenvalues have to have to have a very particular, like they have to be roots of unity whose order divides the order of H, basically. A eigenvalues of C are all of the form, well, are just given by, given by. So what you do is you take, you fix a, so W is a root of unity of order 2 pi i divided by h, so root of unity of order h. And then the eigenvalues are given by W to the E1, W, uh, sorry, omega to the E2, etc., up to omega to the ER. Right? So R is the number of nodes in the Duncan diagram. It's also the dimension of the space because the simple roots form bases. And you get these yeah, the Coxter element is diagonalizable, and the, so 
are given by w by omega to these powers and these powers yeah we can order them in weekly increasing order e1 less than e2 less than etc less than or equal to er and these numbers these integers e1 up to er are called the exponents of w since all Coxeter elements are conjugate, they have the same eigenvalues. And so you get these kind of, you get R integers assigned to any roots, any crystallographic root system. Okay. Uh, and before I give you, give you an example, it's usually going to be type A, let me mention a couple of facts about these exponents. So the first claim is that 1 and n and h minus 1 are always among this list. And actually, yeah, there is, in, in this list, there is always a unique 1 and always a unique h, min h minus 1. So this guy, yeah, the exponent list actually looks like 1 less than e2, less than or equal to e3, etc. e r, min r minus 1, and less than h minus 1. So this is e1, and this is e r. These are always exponents. And therefore, they span a unique, there is an eigenspace spanned by the corresponding two eigenvectors. It's a two-dimensional plane inside your r-dimensional space. And this plane is called the Coxeter plane. Coxeter plane uh, is the two-dimensional plane inside V spanned. So it, it's going to depend on the choice of the Coxeter elements by spanned by the eigenvectors of of a given Coxeter element with eigenvalues mm. well just let, let me just write omega omega and omega inverse because if you if you take omega and you raise it to the power of h minus one that's just going to be omega inverse all right now uh <laughs> Now I guess I can show you the picture again. So uh, this is the picture from Wikipedia of. So I took I took the root system E8. And it has a bunch of it has an eigenbasis for this Coxeter elements, and then I just project it down to the Coxeter plane by ignoring all these. By just basically sending all these other eigenvectors to zero, and the result looks like this. So inside this Coxeter plane, the Coxeter element always acts by just by rotate by rotation of order h, right? Because these are the two eigenvalues, and that's it. And so there is always this unique Coxeter plane where if you project down your your picture down, you're gonna get something very very nice looking up object. So in, in general, E8 gives you an a configuration of 248 roots in the eight-dimensional space, but then all of those are projected down when you project them down on the plane. So th this eight-dimensional picture is like super symmetric and its symmetry is actually used in problems like sphere packings and stuff like that, but uh, you can't really draw an eight-dimensional space. But luckily for us, you can draw a two-dimensional plane and then project everything down and it's beautiful. All right, now let me try to forget about E8 for now. Let me try to do the same example in type A n minus 1. Example in type uh, type A n minus 1. So what are the exponents in type A n minus 1? Remember the Coxeter number, I can choose any one of them. I, in particular, I can choose the n cycle. 
n minus 1, uh, sorry, it goes, the long, the long cycle goes up to n. And it acts on v. Right? What is v? v is the n minus 1 dimensional space. So it could be set of all vectors in r to the n such that, uh, well, let me write c to the n. Doesn't really matter. Such that the sum of the coordinates xi is equal to zero. That's the span of my root system. Okay, and now the Cox, well, the while group, which is uh, so w is equal to sn as usual, it acts on the space by permuting the coordinates. In particular, the Coxeter number permutes the coordinates cyclically by like one click and preserves this condition that the sum is equal to zero. So what are the eigenvalues of the cyclic shift operator on an n-dimensional, well, on an, on an n-minus-one-dimensional space like this? Well, the eigenvalues are eigenvalues are you just, you just kind of, uh, you put omega, omega squared, all the way up to omega to the um, all the way up to omega to the n minus one, right? These are the eigenvalues. It does not preserve any non-zero element, any non-zero vector. But then, like the corresponding eigenvectors, eigenvectors are just basically they form a Vandermond matrix. Right? So eigenvector eigenvector for let's say zeta equal to w to some power m is 1 zeta zeta squared zeta uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce that up to z zeta n minus n minus 1 clearly if you permute this uh, if you if you cyclically shift this guy, then it's going to be just the same thing as multiplying by omega to the by, by zeta, basically. Yeah. Okay. So, so the conclusion is that the exponents are well e one up to e n are given by just one, two, all the way up to sorry e n minus one up to n minus one. These are these are the exponents of type a n minus one. So that's kind of a, a very simple exercise, but in general, it it may be harder. So let me again. There is always there is going to be a table. Here is the table, which I downloaded from some paper on the internet. So here you can see. Uh, the exponents, yeah, we, we did it for type a n minus 1, here it's a n, so the exponents are from 1 up to n. For type d, they are a bunch of odd numbers together with n minus 1. For e6, e7, e8, well, you get some numbers. But you can always see that, okay, I, I told you that, what did I tell you? Yeah, let me write it down again. 1 and h minus 1 are always exponents. So here the Coxeter number h is n plus 1, and 1 and n are exponents. Here it's 2n, so 1 and 2n minus 1 are exponents. And 12, so you see 1 and 11. Okay, Coxeter number is 18, so you see 1 and 17. You always see 30 is 1 and 29. And etc. And, and these are the two exponents that give you the above picture for E8. Okay, so, and that's it. That's this table is basically all you need to know if you want to do a lot of root system combinatorics. You can uh, somehow these exponents and these Coxeter numbers are very important. They you can compute everything for your root system in terms of these numbers here. And let me, I guess, I now I want to just flash 
a few formulas for your root system in terms of uh, in terms of these numbers here, and then I'm going to use the same numbers to describe more stuff about cluster algebras. Okay, so what are um, what are some nice formulas for the for your root system? Well, uh, I guess here is a couple of nice ones. So uh, you, you know, I mentioned before that the we have the symmetric group, we have Catalan numbers, permutations, these kind of triangulations, whatever. These objects are type n, type a n, but they sort of they all exist. They can't be generalized very far because uh, okay. there is not a super rich generalization of these objects, but there is a nice family of analogous objects of type bn, cn, zn, etc. And they all have kind of the same properties. So if you if you if you like the symmetric group, you want to prove something there, and then it maybe you can prove it for the other types, where instead of you know taking these exponents, you have to take these exponents, or something like that, or something like this. Anyways, here are the formulas, which are using these numbers here. So the first formula is for the number of roots. The number of roots is first of all, well that's uh, and that, that's a super beautiful formula. It's just r times h. So here, if, uh, let me let me try to move this. So I take phi to be a root system of rank r. Yeah, let me even say that this is a proposition. Then the following formulas are true. The first one is that well, let me erase this. The first one is that the number of roots is just the rank times the Coxter number, which is crazy to think about. Uh, for example, I guess should I do yeah I should do an example. But let me let me first write down the another formula which is twice the sum of the exponents okay so for type a n minus one what is the number of what is the number of roots well the roots are of the form ti minus ej where i is not equal to j and they are both between one and n right these are your roots so then well if i w w was less than j there would have been n just two but uh, since we are taking both positive and negative roots then the size of the root system is n times n minus one okay and what is r r is the rank it, well it's r is the number in the subscript so that's n minus one. What is h? Well, h is the period of the long cycle, so it's equal to n, so it works. But now, uh, yeah, so th these are, right, remember the roots are like, it, it's like the number of diagonals of an n gone. The number of diagonals of an n gone is given by this number, r, r times h, but now, for other types, we don't have any n-gons and diagonals. We still have roots, and in each case, the number of roots is given by the Coxeter number, so the number here times n, basically. So for like for type bn, the number is going to be 2n squared. Is that true, actually? Yeah, let, let's try b2. Type b type bn so the roots are uh, plus or minus ei plus or minus ej where uh, i is not equal to j between 1 and n union with plus or minus ei where i is also between 1 and n so there is two n roots here and 
uh, here I have, I guess still I have, I can choose kind of n choose two pairs. Well, here I, I may actually assume that i is less than j, right? Because then otherwise I would repeat the entries. So the answer is like n choose two times four. So it's two times n times n minus one. Right, the four comes, because I can put, choose the plus or minus here and the plus or minus here. So every pair i less than j gives me four roots. Uh, yeah, so I get 2n squared minus 2n plus 2n. And the size of phi is equal to 2n squared, which is r times h. r is equal to n, and h is equal to 2n, according to this table here. And you can keep going. Yeah, you can actually, for type E8, you get the uh, number of roots is, oh, I guess I didn't. Yeah, I said it was 248. The actual number of roots is 240. Uh, yeah, anyway, never mind. Number of roots is 240 for type E8. It's the dimension of the Lie algebra. Whatever, never mind. Anyway, so the first formula is this one. The second formula, let me also, let me write them down right next to each other. The second formula tells you the number of elements in the while group. And that's where you need the exponents. So the, that's like the number of permutations. The product over i from one up to r, uh, ei plus one. So you take these exponents plus one, and then you multiply them together. Now you can compute easily the size of any while group. So for example, for type, e -N, type a n, for type a n minus one, this is gonna be the size of w is w is s n, so that's n factorial, and then the exponents are one, two, up to n minus one, so that's gonna be two times three times all the way up to n, which is n factorial. So these are the two, I mean, I like these formulas. So how the Coxter number, the Coxter element and its eigenvalues tell you sort of everything about the root system. And there's actually a statement for number of roots, there is a statement that the you, when you apply the Coxter element, like every root appears once in the, well, every simple root, um, what am I trying to say? Yeah, there is, a, anyways, there is a weird statement. Yeah, never mind. There, there is a statement that if you act in a certain tricky way, then every every root is going to appear once in the orbit of a simple root. But, but it has to be not literally the H, the Coxter, the Coxter element, but it has to be some kind of tricky action. Yeah, anyways, the point is that this fact admits a bijective proof for all root systems. Now, okay, this was uh, me talking about root system. Actually, I'm going to yeah, now I'm going to switch a little bit to cluster algebras and use this kind of combinatorics to answer some questions about cluster algebras, which I haven't answered before. And well, one question is that I promised to answer but haven't done this yet. Question, how many clusters. Right, so how many clusters are there in a finite type cluster algebra? Right, remember for type, so for example, for type a n minus one, the clusters, so the cluster variables corresponded to diagonals, and then the clusters were in bijection with triangulations of an n gone. So 
So the number of clusters was given by the catalog number. Or was it, um, yeah, up to maybe instead of A, M is, is it? Yeah, I have to ship this somehow. Yeah, I have to. Okay, for the square, the square is of type A1 and has two triangulations. So, um, I think it should be, should correspond to n equals to 3, right? 1 over 4 times 6 to 3. No, that's. No, that's 20. Yeah, that's, okay, I'm. <laughs> All right, let, let, let's say I want to write down the square. It has two triangulations. So this is, and the quiver is of type A1, right? Because there is only one non-frozen vertex here, and there is a bunch of frozen vertices, but for a finite type, we only take the mutable quiver, which is of type A1. And the number of uh, clusters, in this case, is two. That's the number of triangulations. If I take a pentagon, Then this is type A2, and the number of clusters is 5. Right. And if I. Uh, so I guess I have to. Okay, right. So if. So if, if I say AN a n minus 1, AN minus 1 for. Uh, and then n is going to be equal to 2 here, and then 3 here, and yeah, 4, etc. So indeed, I get uh, one over one over n plus one, like one over two plus one times uh, four choose two is equal to two, and one over three plus one times uh, six choose three is equal to fourteen, hopefully, well, to five, hopefully, yes, and etc. So indeed, uh, this is this is true as stated. For type a n minus one, the number of clusters is just given by this formula. Okay. Now, what happens in general? You can take any finite type cluster algebra. You're going to get finitely many seeds. How many do you get? And the answer is pretty nice. Theorem uh, for. Uh, if it's, if you start with a cluster algebra, you have x tilde b tilde uh, of finite type. Um, I guess yeah, I, sh I, I have to consider. So let phi be the corresponding uh, crystallographic root system, right? So finite type cluster algebras correspond to Dinkin diagrams, uh, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Then the number of clusters is given by. Well, let me just number of clusters is given by the product for i from one up to r. Right. So the r is Num the rank of the root system is the same as the number of mutable vertices. And it's given by the product over this kind of, if you've seen the hook content formula, then it's kind of similar. So you take the product of EI plus H plus 1 divided by EI plus 1. And that is the number of clusters in an arbitrary cluster algebra of finite type which I think is pretty cool. You just get a nice product formula. And of course, the number of cluster variables, as I mentioned earlier, number of cluster variables is just equal to the size of the set of almost positive roots, which is given by n times h plus 2 over 2. So what is the reason for that is well, the almost positive roots are, they consist of positive roots and negative simple roots. 
So the number of positive roots is one half of the number of total roots, because every root is either positive or negative, and they are related by negation. And the number of all roots is r times h. So in, in this case, it's going to be uh, n times h over 2. And then uh, the side of delta is, of course, r, which is just n. So if you sum up these two numbers, you get this number here. So this kind of second part is a, a simple consequence of the stuff we already know. But the first part is new and it's kind of, it's pretty interesting, right? Because it gives you, well, okay, first of all, first of all, for type A n minus 1, what is this formula? The product over i from 1 up to, well, okay, here I have a clash of notation. This is supposed to be the rank of your root system. i from 1 to n minus 1. Okay, and the exponents are 1, 2, 3, up to n minus 1. So I get uh, basically ei is equal to i. Then h is equal to n, 1 plus n plus 1, uh, sorry, i plus n plus 1, divided by i plus 1. So in other words, that's the product. I guess uh, on the top it runs from n plus 2, n plus 3, all the way up to, wait, am, am I not doing this right? Uh, it runs all the way up to i equal to n minus 1 and when this is 2n. And I divide by 2 times 3 times all the way up to, oh yeah, it's good, all the way up to, yeah, so when i is n minus 1, then the denominator is n. And indeed, this is this is 1 over n plus 1 times 2n choose n, right? Because uh, 2n choose n is what? It's n plus 1, all the, the product of from n plus 1 to 2n divided by 1 up to n, 1, 2, 3 up to n, yeah, it's just 2n factorial divided by n factorial and n factorial. So you get kind of the first n factorial cancels out with the denominator. And then uh, this is almost the same formula as here, except that you divide additionally by n plus 1. So the, this product on the in the numerator starts from n plus 2. Okay. So, so this is exactly Catalan, Catalan numbers, this product in type A n minus 1. So you can study, as you are, are probably familiar with, Catalan numbers mm, count many things. They count non-crossing partitions, non-crossing matchings, triangulations, dig paths, you name it. And now you can ask, okay, let's say I take some other root system. Like I say, let's say what are non-crossing partitions of type D? And it turns out there's a, there's a lot of beautiful root system combinatorics coming from just trying to generalize uh, various Catalan objects to other root systems, for example. And one of these Catalan objects is clusters in the cluster algebra of finite type. So I thought that was kind of cool. And the, yeah, so I'm not sure we're going to need exponents in the future, but I think the Coxter number is going to play a big role in what in what follows. But for now, let me also explain one other piece of combinatorics for root systems, and that's going to be yeah. I want to introduce a fine a fine Dinkin diagrams. I'm also going to need them later for uh, for my study of cluster algebras, but for now let me just show you a picture. Uh, there should be a picture, oops, there is no picture, oh, there is a picture, okay. So here is a picture, that's basically all you need to know. I'm going to explain this a little bit more today, but all you need to know is that, okay, here are your usual Dinkin diagrams, that's a screenshot from Wikipedia, 
and then for each Dinkin diagram, for each, these are called finite, like finite type Dinkin diagrams, for each of them there is an affine Dinkin diagram, which is obtained from a finite Dinkin diagram by adding a single node at a particular place. So it turns out that each Dinkin diagram already knows, already has a specified place, like we, we didn't make any choices, it kind of chooses itself to, like type AN tells you, okay, there should be a node added so that it forms a cycle. And type BN tells you, okay, there should be, you should add a green node so that it kind of looks like type D here. So there is, it, there is a theory of a finely algebras and things like that, which tells you that like if you take E6, then it becomes E6 tilde, right? So the corresponding affine type is denoted with a tilde and you add a green node so it becomes kind of symmetric. And similarly for E7, so E7 looks like this and then it tells you that the node should be added here and again it becomes symmetric. But yeah, E8 is not really symmetric. Okay, so now let me try, I mean, I don't, I'm not really a big fan of given just, you know, here are affine Dinkin diagrams, like just memorize this list. I want to explain a little bit where they come from. And the way to do that, that's, I guess, access most accessible is to just talk about affine reflection groups. So previously we talked about finite reflection groups, uh, finite reflection groups. And, but today I want to talk about also what is called affine reflection groups. And for finite reflection groups, well, uh, there was, I uh, started by asking that all hyperplanes, right, all these reflection hyperplanes as alpha pass through the origin. And, but for affine reflection groups, I'm going to allow shifted hyperplanes. Right. If you have a, any hyperplane, it doesn't necessarily have to pass through the origin, you can reflect with respect to that hyperplane. So I want to choose a bunch of affine hyperplanes, and I'm going to ask that the result is, the resulting group is going to be infinite, but I want it to be discrete. So here I get a finite, finite group. Here I'm going to get an infinite discrete, uh, discrete group. And yeah, th so there is, uh, yeah, there is one more. So th you can also talk about Cartan matrices of of these affine Dinkin diagrams. And here, if you remember the Cartan matrix, Cartan matrix was positive definite. And here it's going to be positive uh, semi definite. Semi definite. And it, it keeps going. Like there is. Here there is a finite dimensional Lie algebra, here there is an infinite dimensional but kind of nice affine Lie algebra, and etc. But I just want to show you the pictures. So if you start with a root system, with a finite kind of crystallographic root system, it tells you, oh, it tells you kind of a unique way to get an affine infinite reflection group from that. And the corresponding picture looks like this. So that's the rank two. rank to affine reflection groups. So you can see in this description, so yeah, instead of just taking, so here is my root system of type A2, right? And then it tells me somehow, so what I, I start with the hyperplanes orthogonal to the simple roots. So I, I can choose a hyperplane 
No, let me even try. There's hyperplane like this, and then there's a hyperplane like this, which are orthogonal to the simple roots. But then there is one more hyperplane. So there is something called the longest negative root. It's kind of the root that's that's points in the mo in, in that kind of for your choice of simple roots. There is uh, one. So this guy in blue is the longest root, and then it's negative. There is a an opposite to it, which is the longest negative root. And so if it, if I take this longest negative root and I look at the hyperplane that's orthogonal to it but kind of, uh, yeah, let me, let me try to make these, uh, okay, never mind. The point is that there's one more hyperplane, which goes like this. So you take hyperplane, or hyperplanes are orthogonal to simple roots, and then one more, which is orthogonal to the longest root, the longest root, but it's kind of shifted. Right, you see that the origin is here, but the hyperplane passes through. Uh, it's it it has the dot product of one with the with the longest root, basically. And so you have this little domain that's called the fundamental domain. And then as you start reflecting with respect to these hyperplanes, you're going to get this kind of very nice grid, this triangular grid here. And then in type B two, it's going to look like this. And in type G two, it's going to look like this. So you see, I'm, I'm not getting like infinitely many hyperplanes with uh, like irrational angles or anything like that. I get a discrete group. And the kind of the, these, uh, so I get, the, here I have two simple roots. So I have two kind of simple hyperplanes and then there is one more that corresponds to the longest root. And these are, these hyperplanes, they correspond to the nodes of the affine Dinkin diagram. So this kind of extra, this kind of extra hyperplane I add in these cases is always uh, okay. it gives you it corresponds to this green node somehow and the edges then tell you like for any two hyperplanes what's the order of the of the reflection if I multiply them the reflections together what's the order of in the corresponding Coxeter group and etc so yeah anyways what all I want to say is that affine root systems just are just pictures like this, but higher dimensional. And they are obtained by adding a single node to your finite Dinkin diagram. And one curious uh, property of a fine Dinkin diagrams I want to mention is, yeah, there is a whole bunch of interesting properties. And so here is another, basically I want to characterize First of all, I want to forget about the kind of the non-ADE types. And then for the ADE types, I want to uh, I want to explain a very nice characterization, which is due to Winberg. And I'm going to use that characterization later. So what what's going to what is it going to be? So uh, here is a definition. Let's say I start with a so let gamma be a finite simple graph just you just draw any just draw your favorite graph could be a cycle or something the peterson graph doesn't matter uh, then uh, w what i what i say is that a a labeling is just a, s a labeling is just an assignment uh, lambda of positive real numbers to the vertices of my graph. The labeling is called, I'm going to call it sub-additive, sub-additive, if it satisfies, if twice the value at every vertex is strictly bigger than the sum over all, uh, over all edges, so the sum over all neighbors of my vertex, and then I take the values of my labeling at these numbers. So twice the value, if I have a vertex V, and I have some neighbors, W1, W2, W3, then twice the label at this vertex should be bigger than the sum of its neighbors. And the labeling is called additive 
if instead of a strict inequality, I have an equality here. Twice the lambda of V is equal to the sum of the lambda of W, where W are just neighbors. Yeah, let me, doesn't really matter, but, okay. Now here is a theorem, which is due to Zinberg. Lindbergh, 1971. Okay, let G be a simple finite graph. Or just, yeah, let's say gamma to be consistent. Be a simple graph. Then, uh, then there is two statements. The first statement is that gamma admits a sub additive labeling if and only if if and only if if and only if what i mean that's a pretty cool theorem if and only if gamma is an age dinkin diagram And the second part is that gamma admits a, an additive labeling if and only if, if and only if gamma is an affine ADE Dinkin diagram. So remember I mentioned that these Dinkin diagrams, they just show up in many places, just unexpectedly. And I think this is like the, the, um, the simplest characterization. Like you can, you can find your favorite high school student and you can just come to them and ask like, define these labelings and then say, okay, find me all simple graphs that have one of these labelings. And if it's a bright high school student, they should be able after a while to just without knowing anything about Dinkin diagrams, they should give you the list, which is exactly consists of AD Dinkin diagrams and affine AD Dinkin diagrams. So let me finish by showing you a bunch of examples. And I'm also, um, so for, well, the additive labeling is kind of unique because it's given by equalities, but subadditive labeling is not, not unique. So I'm, on, on, I'm going to show you the additive ones first. Here is the picture. Here is the picture of an additive labeling for any affine ADE Dinkin diagram. Uh, you can see that uh, twice the value at, at each vertex is equal to the sum of the values of its neighbors. Like four is equal to one plus one plus two. 6 is equal to 2 plus 2 plus 2, and etc. So you can see that these, I mean, these are colored black and white, but don't really pay attention to this right now. But you can see that these nodes, uh, like we added this extra node to E7 and got a, a E7 tilde, and then you should just do 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, 1, and then you put it to here, and then you get an additive labeling. And for E8, uh, similarly, I mean, it looks a little kind of, it still doesn't look symmetric, but there is an additive labeling. 12 is equal to four plus three plus five. So I find Dinkin diagrams are the only graphs that have such a labeling. Feel free to verify that at home. And yeah, and so basically to get a, a sub-additive labeling, you have to kind of remove one node and then you just kind of slightly modify these labels. Instead of like one, 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 you put one, one plus epsilon, one plus three epsilon, some, well, or anyway, something like this, one plus epsilon squared, I don't even remember. Yeah, but the point is that you can kind of, these are the fundamental labelings. And finally, so the cool fact about these labelings is that 
the Coxeter number of a Dinkin diagram, right? So uh, the Coxeter number H of a Dinkin diagram is equal to the sum of the labels of the additive labeling of the yeah I want to say of the smallest of the smallest integer additive labeling of the correspondent of the correspondent affine Dinkin diagram gamma tilde right so uh, here is the table of Coxeter numbers again you see there is E6 has Coxeter number 12 well if you sum up all these numbers um, <laughs> you get yeah, you get 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 that's 12 and for E7 it's 18 so you get uh, 6 plus 6 plus 6 that's 18 for E7 the 30 like the 30 from the picture is yeah okay this is 10 and then this is also 10 and then the rest is also 10 so it's 30 so if you ever forget the Coxeter number of E7 what you what you should remember is you can reconstruct it by just finding the unique so there's always the unique this kind of smallest integer labeling which has so the extra node has label 1 in all these cases oops sorry yeah the extra node is here which is another way to remember uh, like where to add where is the extra node for e8 it's the extra node is always labeled by one and that's actually if and only if you can remove any node labeled one from any of the Dinkin diagrams and you're going to get a finite the corresponding finite type Dinkin diagram so i guess that's uh that's basically it for today i'm gonna see you all on wednesday have a nice weekend <laughs>